uh, certain reasons to uh, care about, but more also how we could go about uh, caring about code quality. Uh, best time to ask a question or make a comment is when you have it, so please don't wait till the end. Uh, anytime you have a question, uh, just raise your hands or uh, just attract my attention and I'll more than be happy to um, uh, yield to you and listen to you. So the first question is, why, why care about code quality? What, what's the big deal about it? Now certainly, we want to be agile, right? So what does agile mean? Agile means we're going to get feedback, and based on the feedback, we're going to go back and uh, respond to those changes. And then go to the customer and say, here are the things we did last time. You wanted us to make these changes, so here you go. And take a look at it, review it. Let's move on forward. But as you are sitting there with the customers and asking them what kind of change you need to make, you begin to realize that the particular change they want you to make, if you were going to make it, you would, go, you would have to touch that piece of code. Remember the one that I'm talking about, right? That piece of code that you touched the last time and you could not go home that weekend. You're going to quietly tell the customer, you know what, that's not a good change after all because you don't want to spend yet another weekend at work. So in other words, uh, the, one of the main reasons to, be, uh, 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 to, to really care about code quality is, as simple as that, you cannot be agile if your code sucks. And so it's important for us to care about code quality. Now this doesn't mean just because you have a good quality code, you're agile. I'm not, I'm not saying that, right? But it's really hard to be agile if your code sucks. You've got to have other things, but this is an important thing as well. But why, why, why really focus on code quality? That's the reason. But as uh, Albus and Sussman uh, talk about this in their book on software, in, in the SICP book, um, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So we all write code and we focus so much on writing code. But more than writing code, we have to make sure that the code we write is actually readable. Now why is it important for us to be able to read somebody's code in our team? And the reason is, we write code just once, but we have to maintain it continuously. And if you're not going to maintain the code, what's the point in writing that? And, and any code that you write has to be maintained. If somebody tells you that they wrote a code once, and they never changed the design or the code, what they're telling you is that the project got canceled, right? So any code that's relevant to the marketplace has to evolve and change. So that's very important. So it's important for us to be able to read the code and understand it. Now, of course, right off the bat, I would ask you, how do you write readable code? Now, I've worked with several people. Somebody would tell you, my code is readable. You say, how do you know your code is readable? And they would say, my code is readable because I wrote it. That doesn't count, right? Because that person who wrote it may be able to read it, but that person may be the only one who is able to read it. You probably have worked in companies where the boss tells you, whatever you do, don't touch that piece of code because the guy who wrote it no longer works here and nobody understands it, right? And it's really hard when you have code like that. Or you work with people who write code, they can understand it, but when you come back from vacation, they cannot understand it. Well, of course, that's easy to fix, right? No vacations for you. But what if this person dies, God forbid, right? Or quits, then somebody else has to maintain it still. That becomes really hard. So what do we do about it? So in my opinion, there's only one way I know of to make code readable. It is to read it. So if you write a piece of code, give it to somebody else and let them kick and scream, and then they will give you the input, and then eventually the code becomes readable. So it's important for us to read the code. But then why, why again? And the reason simply is that a software project as we create it has to evolve. And the evolution comes from change in requirements. So depending on the size of the project, as the bigger the project is, the more the opportunity for the requirement to change. And if you're going to change the requirement, that eventually is going to come and impact and change the code. So if you, I know it, when I used to work in software years ago on traditional projects, I would he hear words like this, we froze the requirement. Another word for being stupid, right? There's no way you can you know, freeze requirements. It's, it, it, you know, a lot of things will keep changing. We could, that, that's not called freezing the requirement. The, uh, the right term is we're in denial of change in requirements. That's what the real term is. But they don't want to tell you that way, right? 
So you cannot freeze the requirements. It's going to change. Whether you want to change and accept it or not is the question. And when you do have to change the requirements, you have to come and change the code. If the code is incredibly hard to make change, then you're not able to respond to those change, and it becomes really hard. So we have to be able to respond to this. In other uh, situation, the cost of finding and fixing defects increases as time goes on. If you were to write a piece of code, and let's say within about two minutes or less, immediately you know that the code is poor, and it's, it's, it's messed with something. You can fix it right away. What if you get to know the next day? Yeah, you can still fix it. What if you get to know about three weeks from now? You have to first stop what you're doing, and then go back and do this fix. That takes away time from what you're working on, right? Second, what, how much of this do you remember in three weeks, after three weeks? If I was writing the code, I would even question if it's my project. That's how short term my memory is, right? So you've got to context switch and, and pick up what you left on. And if it's a year after you wrote the code, it's even more difficult. And sometimes you get these requests after a couple of years, and you have to, again, a huge amount of context, which is more expensive. Not only that, when you get that far, it's not one person who is involved. It's several people who are involved in fixing the bug or the error or, or, or changing. So it's important for us to be doing this very quickly for us to get a good, uh, effective, um, you know, to be economical, if you will. So there is a way to think about, you know, how do you, de uh, you know, detect defect and how do you reduce a defect? We're not talking about fixing defects. How do you reduce it? There's a top 10 list by Bohem. He uh, talks about this. And the first thing he says is, finding and fixing problem in production code is 100 times more expensive than during requirements and design phase. So, so you want to definitely do it as soon as possible. And, and, and then he goes on to say that 40 to 50% of error on projects is avoidable rework, you know, where we can go back and keep changing things if we can avoid some of these things. Talk about 80% of avoidable rework comes from 20% of defects, and of course 80% of defects come from 20% modules. But what's really interesting about this is that 90% of downtime on projects come from 10% of defects. So do we want the software to be completely defect free? I think that's a myth. It's almost impossible to create a defect free software. But there are only two things I aspire to do. One is I don't want to reintroduce defects. You found a defect, you fix it. I don't want it to creep back in, right? I want to just quash it forever. And I, don't, I want a good regression so I don't have to re, keep refixing the defects. The second thing is, you, you want to really look at the ones that have the major impact. Uh, there's no point in sweating on small stuff, so it's important to focus on real things that we can fix. Going further, they talk about peer review catches 60% of defects. Now, don't quote me wrong, don't tweet this wrong, but given all context, if you ask me, given a choice between writing unit test and doing code reviews, given choice between these two, I strongly prefer code reviews. I've done this on projects, and I cannot believe anything that gives enormously better results than code reviews. Now, what is the reason to do code reviews? Code review gives an opportunity for other people to look at your code. That means they are reading your code. And I mentioned earlier, the only easy way to create readable code is to read it. So when somebody reviews your code, they are doing code review already. If they cannot understand it, they're going to give you the feedback. They also look for various conditions, another pair of eyes, another brain looking through it. And I have very strong belief in code review. But having said that, it's extremely important who is doing the code review. Now, if in your organization, lowly programmers write code, and then the so-called architects who don't code anymore review code, it is a dangerous situation to be in. What you want is the person reviewing the code should be a fellow programmer who writes code along with you. And in other words, don't go to the so-called priesthood-based code review. These are people who sit there and look at the wall all day, and then they say they can review the code for you, right? And they have not written any production code in a long time. These guys are dangerous. If you work in a company where the review only happens by these priesthood you know, architect, my recommendation is do not walk away from those companies. Run. There's no point working in those organizations, right? You want real guys on the project reviewing the code and giving you the feedback. Perspective-based reviews are really critical because they catch 35% more defect than 
non-directed reviews. That's why you want these people to be active reviewers on code. The worst kind of reviews you can get is where the curly bracket should be. We all know where the curly bracket should be, right? You don't need somebody to review that for you. What you want is they, you want them to review to, and say, you know, what kind of you know, things you have forgotten, what kind of algorithms you could use, and so on. And then again, quality of code, is it readable? That's very important. And as people are reviewing this code, I, I, I get the opportunity to work with some really brilliant people from time to time, depending on the project. And a lot of times I would review the code, I would say this code is really great. But my review back to them would be, hey, you forgot to write these few test cases. So not only do we review code, we also review the test cases that go with it as well. This also ensures that people actually are writing test cases fairly well. And disciplined personal practices can reduce defect introduction rate by 75%. Let's note that down. We're not saying discipline reduces defect, no. We are saying def uh, uh, discipline reduces defect introduction, right? That's even better than reducing defects. So if you have discipline and if you practice, this is hard work, we can start reducing defect introduction quite a bit. And it costs 50% more per source instruction to develop high dependable software product. Let's not kid ourselves. It costs money, it costs time, it costs effort. If somebody says, we don't want to spend money, but we want to get results quickly, that's called gambling, right? They need to go buy lottos, not develop software. It takes time, it takes money, it takes effort. I was, I was at a client site a couple of years ago, and, and they said, hey, it's all great, you come and talk about quality to us, this is fantastic, but how do we know that any of these is gonna change anything in our company? And my first response to them is, it's your problem, not mine, right? And then eventually I said, yes, you are right. If you want these to change, I'm gonna leave, right? You guys are the ones who are gonna be sitting there and doing stuff. And, and if you want to make change, then you need to have somebody who takes responsibility and spends the time and effort doing that. So in other words, my recommendation to them was for every software project they wanted to improve quality on, I asked them to go find one person, a technical person, who would be a champion on the project. Not a project manager, you see, but a technical guy, not a team leader, not certainly an architect. There is no other term I fear more than architect, right? So not a, not a, somebody who is technical, but who is eager, passionate, interested, dedicated, disciplined, and say, you are a champion in this project. And your job is to come up with initiatives to improve the software quality. Tell me what you're gonna do in a month. Tell me what you're gonna do in three months, in six months. Come up with a plan of things you're gonna do, and evolve this plan along the way, but have a champion. And this worked really well for them because they did find these champions in the company and they worked really hard to improve the quality of their product. But unless somebody is going to be there responsible and spends time and effort, don't expect quality to improve all of a sudden magically. This only works when people devote time and effort to do this. 40 to 50% of user programs have non-trivial defects. So these are the top 10 lists that they talk about. But, but you all know this, right? We all know this. We have read this in books. We have read this everywhere, we have heard this. But then what happens when you go back to work? And it's so funny when you see this happen, right? The evidence is overwhelming, but still companies don't want to do this. What, what do we see there? We never seem to have time to do it, but we always have time to redo it. You tell, hey, this is going to take time. Oh no, we got to ship it. No time for it. Then we create a massive mess. Now the company is willing to spend all the time and money required to fix this nonsense, right? So they never have time to do it, but they always have time to redo it. So this is something we have to break the cycle. This is the industry-wide hypocrisy. Einstein said the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over and suddenly expect a different result. And, and what do we have? We have projects that fail continuously. Uh, Capers Jones talk about software projects, failure rate. Can somebody guess? Throw a number, don't worry about being wrong. How many, what percent of software projects actually succeed? 20%. How, and his number was more like 10%. 10% of projects succeed. Of course, his definition of success was, is delivered fairly on time, within budget, works like you wanted it to work, and customers are happy to use. And I've heard people say, oh my God, that's too restrictive. Right? 
Now think about this. 10% of projects actually are successful. You're, you're going to buy a house. And the builder says, come on over. We're ready to sell a house for you. You say, tell me what you have done. And they show you around. And there are 90 houses fallen down, crashed down. 10 of them barely standing. And they say, you could be one of those lucky ones to have those houses standing. Build with us. Or the flight attendant says, buckle up your uh, you know, seat belt. We got 90 flights missing today, but don't worry. We're going to get you there safely. Right? And yet, we develop software projects, and what do we do differently? We have hope. And we say, this time it's going to be different. Right? I can only think of two professions where we have such a low, low success rate. Only two professions where we keep doing this. One is programming, and the other is politics. We know these guys are no good, yet we elect them. And we put our faith over and over. You know what? There's not a whole lot I can do about our interest in politics, but I hope people in this room can do something about programming, right? So let's at least make change where we can. So there's definitely a case for doing something better. But one of the things we need to think about is technical debt. So what is a technical debt? Now, technical debt simply is the things that we accrue along the way, a little shortcut we took, is it really wrong to accrue technical debt? Absolutely not. It is actually a pragmatic thing to accrue technical debt. You, if you don't accrue technical debt, you are becoming dogmatic. You're saying, I will make everything perfect. But you see, the problem is this. What is perfect? I don't know what perfect is. Because I may spend 10 days doing something to perfect it, and you come along and say, you idiot, why did you waste time doing this? After all, we don't even need this in the current release. So you want to get something fairly quickly done, but not a quick fix where you ignore what you know, but get something up and say, you know, based on what we know right now, we're going to build this. There is these things we don't know quite, so we don't want to invest time on it right now, but that may incur a certain debt, but that's okay, we are ready to fix it. But okay, we're going to acquire a bit of a technical debt. But the first thing I would do is don't avoid technical debt, but have a good sense of what your debt is. And once you know what your debt is, you say, we're going to fix these debt along the way. So here's what I would ask you to think about. You are scheduling your iterations or sprint, whatever you want to call it. I'll use the terms interchangeably here, sprint and iteration. You're scheduling your iteration. And what are you saying? You're saying, I'm going to spend this much amount of time implementing the features. But when you're doing your sprint planning or iteration planning, you need to also say explicitly, here is a certain amount of time we're going to dedicate to fix our technical debt. You need to schedule time to fix technical debts. If you don't schedule time to fix technical debts, where do you spend the time on doing it? And if you don't, you keep accruing technical debt. Now, what happens if you accrue technical debt? The technical debt is like financial debt, right? I go around and charge my credit card. And every month I charge my credit card. At the end of the month, I get a bill. It says, Venkat, you, you, you are supposed to pay this. And I say, you know what? Why do we want to pay the stupid credit card bill when I have the money and I can buy more things today? Because I have ego to go buy stuff. So I go buy stuff. And I send the minimum balance to the credit card company and say, here, have it. And the next month, I have more bill. I send the minimum amount still. And after a few months, my balance has exceeded to a great level. But what happens now? The credit card company sends me a letter. And they tell me that I've exceeded my credit limit but you see, I'm a valued customer, so they increase my credit limit because the credit card company really cares about me, right? And then what happens? I continue to charge. And one day I realize my credit card bill is much more than my yearly salary. Oh dear, how do I do this? What do I do it? And I quickly think of one option. I can grow a beard, change my name, and move to another state. Just for the sake of record, that's not the reason I left Texas. And so the point really is that there would be a point when we no longer can pay it. And what do we do? We have to declare bankruptcy. A number of projects do this. They declare technical bankruptcy, also known as people quietly quit. They say, this is totally unmaintainable. I'm going to go work somewhere else. So we have to develop the sense and say, we need to pay this off. By the way, this is also a professional responsibility, right? As you're developing application, you have to have a sense of what you're creating so that you don't accrue these debts and create poor quality. How what does it mean to create poor quality? 
Now, this reminds me of an experience, and please do tell me you were exactly like this too, otherwise I'll feel really bad. Remember the time you were in college? Well, I was in college, and we rented an apartment. There were like three or four of us having this apartment. We would just live in this apartment, but we would never clean it. We would never vacuum it. We'll just completely trash this place. And one day, this becomes very unbearable. But it was very easy to fix. We'll just move. And we'll go to another apartment. And we would get a brand new apartment, beautifully furnished, clean, well painted. And we would be there for about six months until we'd make a mess of it. And then we'll move to another apartment. You guys were like that too, right? Thank you. That's good. And when I joined work, I thought that's how life was. Like you work on a project, you trash it, and you then leave to another project. But then when I did it the first time, I realized the project you learn, you go into, they didn't have the cleaning crew. You are the cleaning crew because somebody else has left before. And then you realize life is not like that on, in the industry, right? That you got to make, and you have to inherit code, and you got to maintain the code. So if you say you received very bad code, there's a name for it. The reason you got really bad code to work with is called karma. You cannot change your past. But you cannot say, you guys gave me bad code, I'm going to leave a worse code on your hands before I leave. That only will you know, decrease from your karma bank. You don't want to mess with your karma bank, right? So you've got to fix this along the way. That's very critical. So it's very important for us to pay this technical debt along the way. That is extremely important. So we need to measure how well the software is designed and implemented, but it's a very qualitative approach. There are some ways to make it quantitative. We'll see that a little bit later. So how do you measure this? It's very hard to measure, but we need some metrics. Here is a metric that you should definitely avoid doing if you are doing it. It's called the line of code. There's nothing more stupid than that. Because if you take this measure, either way it is wrong. If you say you have more code, you are good, then programmers get together. You know the smart programmers, they don't write more code. They write programs that spit more code, right? Because after all, if you want more code, I can produce that. But overnight, you come back, wow, you worked all night long because we see more code in the system. Now, having fewer lines of code is better. That is a nonsense too. Because sometimes when you have fewer lines of code, it may not be concise code, it may be a terse code. What is a terse code? A terse code is a code which is fewer lines of code and you have no clue what it's doing. It's whatever a pack and you cannot understand what it's doing, right? So the point is, you cannot measure quality based on lines of code. So don't do it and if you're doing it, uh, quit doing it or quit from the company that's doing it. Now, it's very highly subjective, right? What is quality? Sure, you can say this is quality, but, but how do you measure it? It's, there's no real good standard to do, do that, but we can try a few options. It is very qualitative. If a code is readable, or is it understandable? That is something we want to evaluate. But again, like I said, how do you evaluate that? Have somebody read it. Somebody who's knowledgeable on the project read it. You don't want to go find a guy, a layman on the street and say, can you read my code, right? The person doesn't understand it. And is the code verbose? Is the variable names and method names meaningful? How many times have you seen code where a variable name is single letter? Have you? Yeah, all of us have, right? I was teaching a course in Virginia, and this client said, I was telling about code quality, and, and I was talking about variable names. And this guy said, we're a big software company. How dare you come to us and talk about you know, naming variables? I said, well, I'm sure I've seen really bad code. I, I thought you guys do that too. And this guy said, oh, I was just giving you trouble. Uh, and I was preaching them that you shouldn't have single letter variables. About six months later, I was back in the company teaching another course. And this guy came to me and said, hey, remember we met last time? I said, yes. He said, I want you to know you made a big difference in our company. Last time you came and you said, don't use single letter variables. I was very proud. I said, yeah. He said, now we use only two letters, right? <laughs> it's extremely difficult to break this practice, right? And I'm not kidding with you. I was looking at a code. I probably have that later. And, and people write code which is like, really? Why can't you name these variables better, right? And, and that is the real thing. It takes effort to put good variable names. We have to take, take time to do that. Create simple code that works. Now, what is a simple code, by the way? By the way, there are a couple of different problems. Most of us don't know what simple is. Simple is hard. Simple is hard to identify. Einstein said, any intelligent fool can create something violent and dangerous, but it takes a of genius to create something simple. So it requires more time and effort to create simple things. 
But I think there is a problem though. Fundamentally, programmers, not that they cannot create simple code, they don't want to create simple code. I mean, you go to somebody and say, here's the code I wrote, take a look at it. The person looks and says, yep, understood, that's simple. You feel let down. You say, what do you mean? I just showed you the code and you understood it. Give it back to me, I'll be back tomorrow. Then you go back with another version and say, here, take a look at this version now. And this person is scratching his head until the hair falls off. He says, I don't get it. And you're beaming with pride. It's like, yeah, I took a few hours to write it. You better take a few hours to write it, right? So fundamentally, we want complexity, right? Why? Because this code is complex. They say, you know what? We could let, go, let, go people, uh, let people go, but don't touch Joe over there because nobody knows what he is doing, right? That's job security, right? Nobody understands the code you're writing. But the problem is, at one point, you get to the time where that code is so messy, you don't want that job, right? And that's where it becomes a problem for the company that you work for. And do you have test cases? And if you have test cases, what is the coverage of these test cases? How much of code has been covered? So these are some of the things we can look for to measure the quality. But the very first thing I would recommend is, if you're interested in quality, there's a very good time to do it. It is very early. Take a look at a little graph, right? I could say here is a graph of a time. There's a timeline. On any given project, there is a time when you can turn the project towards better, whatever that better is. But the time very rarely comes towards the end. So if you start early, you have a lot of time to make things better. And if you don't start early, one day somebody says, hey, we found a tool we could use. You turn on the tool, and it gives you a million errors and warnings. The first thing you do is, shh, turn off the tool, right? We don't want to see it because nobody has the time to fix all this mess right now. Don't compromise and say, we want quality. We're going to work towards quality. Don't take quick shortcuts and say, you know what? Let's understand this problem and fix it. Schedule a time to lower your technical debt. Every iteration or sprint you say, hey, here is the time you're going to allocate for you know, cleaning up technical debt. How much time can we allocate? That depends on how much time you can provide based on the technical debt that's been accrued. I'm a huge fan of this particular recommendation. Make it work, make it better. Real soon, not in seven years. Make it work, make it better. Don't try to become perfect right now. Make it work first. Once it works, immediately refactor and make it better. This requires monitoring, but more important than monitoring, it requires change in behavior. If you go to a team and say, hey guys, I've got news for you, you can improve quality. If they say, that is great, as long as I don't have to do anything different. That doesn't work, right? And you go to companies and say, we gotta make change, and everybody says, that's a great idea. Let me know what everybody is gonna do. No, we're talking about you. What are you going to change? Then we worry about other people around you changing stuff. So it requires change in behavior. If we are not interested in changing in behavior, don't waste your time thinking about this. Be willing to help and be helped. This is a great thing. You write something, you go to somebody and say, hey, I have something here. Could you tell me how I can improve it? Rather than saying, I wrote something, you better not look at it. And you're defining and holding a fort. When I look at good, good quality, good people, meaning good programmers, what do I see? They write something, they come to you and say, tell me where I am stupid. And I look at their code, I'm like, wow, this is really nice. And I go to guys who say, I don't want to show you my code because I'm really good at what I do. And look at that and it you know, stinks. And so the more you get your code in open and have people look at it, its quality can improve. That's a great way to find better quality code. So devise lightweight, non-bureaucratic measures to do this. So I'm going to talk about what you can do as an individual and what you can do as a, as a company to do this. As an individual, what can you do? First of all, care about design of your code. Pay attention to good design qualities. First of all, very simple things. Is your variable name and method names good? I'll, I'll be very honest about this. This is very difficult for me. And I've realized something over the years, by the way. I, I like to write code. I write a lot of code. But I realized over time that I can never, ever write good quality code. I'll be honest about this. You can sit next to me and say, Venkat, write some code. I would write code and he would say, gosh, that's all you can do? 
and it'll be poor quality. I'll, I'll tell you right away. I cannot write good quality code, but I'm extremely good in finding fault at your code. I can look at your code and I'll kick and scream and tell you how it sucks. So over the years I realized, rather than pretending that I can write great code, I'll write quickly code, and the minute I finish writing the code, I will ask him to review it. And while he is reviewing the code, I will go review somebody else's code. At the end of the day, we both have better quality code. How, how about that? Rather than we sit alone and pretend that we have written good quality code, now we have both arrived at a better quality code. So go ahead and have other people review it. Are your method, sh method short? Are your classes small? How many of you have, think, how many of you think long methods are a great idea? Not a single person, right? I thought you were raising the hand, but you were scratching your face. That's fine. Absolutely not. How many of you have seen long methods in their code? Just look around, right? This is called cognitive dissonance. We know it's wrong to do, but yet we see it. Why is that code so long? Because somebody in your office thought it was a bright idea. And you know what? The problem is, you guys didn't do it. Obviously, I know this. Look at the bright faces here. You guys didn't do it. Those people in the office did it. But the problem is, those guys are still at work today making those methods longer as we speak. There is no way to get out of this, right? So yeah, we have to take effort to make these methods shorter. But one way to really write better quality code is to read better quality code. You see, one of the problems is, if, if you are sitting in a bus, and next to you in the seat, if good quality code was sitting, you won't even know it. You can't look at it, you glance away. You didn't even know this was, oh, you are good quality code, aren't you? It's sitting next to you in the bus. Most of us won't even recognize it if it's sitting next to us, right? So one way to write better quality code is to read better quality code. How do you do that? Go read some good books. Go read some good code. If somebody says, hey, I was looking at this code, I really like it. And when you do code reviews, I'm never even saying Horatio's code. I say, you know what? Hey, good job, buddy. You've done a really good job. Well, don't keep it quiet. Go to the rest of the guys and say, hey, I was looking at this code. I thought this was really good, and I think we should do more of this. So go ahead and show people what a good code is if you find it, especially in other people's code. They don't really believe you if you say, this is my code, look how beautiful it is. You're like, yeah, right. But if you say this is his, the code he wrote, look how beautiful it is. Now people are interested in listening to you, right? Absolutely. And keep it simple. And what is simple? Simple is all the unnecessary things, the craft that goes away, all the clutter, all the things you don't need to do. And it's the bare minimum, does one thing and one thing well. It's simple, single responsibility, right? And write tests with high coverage. Run all your tests before you check in your code, as many as you can, as fast as you can. And check in frequently. I go to companies, I ask them, how frequently do you check in your code? Uh, once in three weeks. How could you check in code once in three weeks? We gotta make sure it's correct. What is correct? This is insane. You gotta check in code as soon as a test passes. And people say, oh my gosh, how could you check in code as soon as a test passes? This is not complete. When was your software complete? Why do we pretend about all these constraints we draw upon ourselves? What will happen if you check in the code right away? Others will use it. What will happen if they use it? They give you feedback. Oh my gosh, I don't want to see it. That, then you're worried about what you're writing. Right? If you put it out and other people give you feedback, it only improves your code. Well, what if I break it? Why would you break it? You ran your test before you checked in. Why would it break? Be brave. Right? Most of us are cowardly. We are brave. Oh, but I won't check in code. I'm worried I would break it. Right? I was at a client's site. I told them, check in code. Oh, no, I will not. Why? Because something may break. I said, look, I guarantee you, I promise to you, if you check in now, if you check in the code now, I guarantee you, nobody would die tonight. Seriously. You're not in a, you know, in a continuous integration mode where this is going to go fire up and launch it and launch some missiles tonight. It's not going to happen. I know what you guys do. Why are you so worried about it? Nobody's going to die because you check in the code. Only we can learn and get better, right? So if you don't check in code frequently, what is frequently? Every minute a test passes, check it in. 
I check in code hundreds of times a day. Hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, depending on what I'm doing. I don't want the code to be sitting on my machine. As soon as something works, I want to check it in. Why? The reason is extremely simple. It's important to ask why though. Why? Because I modify a code. I've not checked it in. I continue to modify it. And I spent four hours modifying this code. And I've not checked it in. And you come along and say, hey, writing all this looks complex. Why don't you make this change? Oh, don't touch it. I've not checked this in yet. I don't want to lose it. You're worried about making the change. Or even worse, what do you do? You start zipping it into multiple directories. Right? This is the worst way to do it. You've got to think of professionalism. If the guy who comes to fix your plumbing does stupid things, would you hire him again? So we've got to watch ourselves. Are we doing stupid things? Would you zip your file in 20 places and keep it? Is that the way to develop software? Say that again? That's even worse. Right? Then you've got to go look at all these shelving. Why don't we just do the right things? Right? We're trying to hide behind things. Of course, if you're using something like Git, it kind of gives you the shell wing and that you keep checking in locally and then you can decide when to push it, right? But again, don't overdo it. It's okay to get the software out there and get the feedback fairly quickly. And then once you do that, you can go back and improve it. So one of the reasons I check in stuff is I can go wild and make changes. In fact, if I'm working on something and I say, you know what? I think there is a way to improve it. You know what's the first thing I do? I check it in. Because I would try to improve it and after about 10 minutes, I realize, and I will simply kick out the change I made, right? Throw it away. And just get from the version control, I'm back on my feet to try my next brilliant idea. And so checking code frequently gives you agility and fearlessness in making change to your software. So that is why I insist on checking in very frequently. Go ahead, please. Great question. Do I check in before I do code reviews? Let me answer that question. The answer is yes. But let me ask, clarify what the answer is. If I, I work with clients, and they are, you know, the pathway to hell is paid with good intentions. You go to them and say, why are you doing this? We had good reasons for it. But you landed in hell. Then don't do it, right? They had good intentions. I go to them and they say, code reviews are great. You told us that. And we read about it. Yes. So we're going to code review before we check in. Then I go around and say, when did you check in last? Two weeks ago. Why? Because I'm waiting for code reviews. Quit doing it, right? So check in code. Keep it continuous. I checked in code, he's reviewing it. Hey, can I come back and change it? Absolutely. We want to improve it, right? So that is why I don't wait until a code review for check in. In fact, I would actually ask the other person to review based on what's been checked in. On the same note, I don't check in without having the test pass. What's the, bad, what's the good news? You're not reviewing code and saying, this code won't even compile. Why am I wasting my time reviewing this code? And so compile it, run the test, review it, great. So check in frequently. Learn your language. I can't tell you how many times I could run across programmers and they'd say, we don't want to do it, why? And they do all kinds of stuff from seven years ago when the language was there. And you look at this, why are you doing all of this? Why didn't you do this, this other feature which came two years ago? and they have not kept up with the language. Learn your language. Don't blame the language for what you cannot do. If you're switching languages or you're a Java programmer learning C-sharp, C-sharp programmer learning Java, learn the idioms, learn the differences. You cannot apply the same thing. The worst kind of guys are the guys, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I go, I go to companies and I meet architects. They secretly tell me, hey, I'm an architect on the product, and the last time I wrote code was six years ago. In fact, some of them are proud of the fact it's scary. We have a name for those guys. We call them the PowerPoint architects. Very dangerous people. They draw pictures and in PowerPoint and they show it to you. And before anything serious happens, they quit leaving a mess behind. So don't, don't encourage PowerPoint architects. Very dangerous guys in your project, right? Let them write code. Let them then be the architects, right? So this is very dangerous. How about the cargo cult programming? What is cargo cult? You look at somebody else and you do what they're doing. Hey, why are you doing it? It worked for them, so it should work for us. But why did that work for them? Ask, understand why that's really applicable. And again, core feedback and criticism. Criticism is a good thing because you can improve. And when you, when you give criticism, don't attack the person. Instead, motivate them to change and tell them how this could be better. Like, that is what criticism is, not, not going and bashing people. 
Keep it simple. Don't build a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Keep it simple so you can understand what this is and maintain it. Don't devise something very complex. And people look at this and say, wow, how does this work? And all this happen before this one thing happens, right? So don't build it. We all have built this in software. You know what's the worst thing? We build it and we are so proud of it. You say, isn't that cool? Right? Absolutely. You've got to change it. So keep it simple. Tony Horst talked about there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complex that there are no obvious deficiencies. Actually, he goes on to say the first one is more difficult to do. So we want to make sure the code is actually easier to understand so we can actually reason the code. If it's so convoluted and confusing, we well, don't even know what it's doing. How do you know if it's correct or what the bug is, right? It's very difficult to go back and fix it. So it's important for us to be able to create simple code so it's easier to reason, easier to understand, and easier to maintain it. That is very important. So what do you do as a team? First, avoid shortcuts. Why are we taking shortcuts? Because we can get this done quickly. Speed is important, but that is a crashing speed. That doesn't help. Take collective ownership. Teams should own the code. By the way, I don't want Venkat's code and Raju's code. That's, that's a, you want to avoid that, right? Whose code is it? It's the team's code. Anybody who has the desire to change the code can change it as long as they take the responsibility to fix it and make sure it's working. Anybody can come and change the code. Why should I do this? If you're a project manager, you want speed. So I got a brilliant idea. You, sir, over there are going to write GUI code from today. And you, sir, are going to write database code from today. You have been designated for XML processing. Sorry. And every day I come to work, these three guys do exactly the same thing. He writes the GUI and nothing else. He writes the database code, nothing else. He's still processing XML, nothing else. Now, are these guys going to be really good at what they do as they do it? Absolutely. So, as a manager, I say, whoa, look at that. These guys are producing code really, really fast. And one day, he says, I quit. This is no fun anymore. Because on the way to work, he writes all the code in his head. And all he has to do is type it. And he's gotten so good at it, he types it, and the compiler doesn't even give an error anymore. And he says, this is not challenging for me. And I don't want to do this work anymore. So he quits. Now we turn around and say, okay, he's gone. Who's going to do it now? And he comes over and says, hey, nobody here knows what he did. Ah, you spoke, so you're going to maintain that code, right? And he opens the code and he says, oh, dear God, what has he done in the code? Nobody in the project understands it. How long is it going to take to get back and moving? Very long, if you're lucky. If not, I worked on a project where they say, we poured concrete over it. This is what I love in our field. They would do stupid things, but they'll give a nice term for it. So you don't feel so bad about it, right? These are called euphemism. We poured concrete over it, meaning we suck and don't look over there. And now what happened? We come to a grinding halt. This is called the truck factor or bus factor. What does that mean? The number of guys in your team who should be run over by a truck or quit for your project to fail. How many, what does that count on your project? Usually one, one guy. I've seen this in large enterprises. They got 100,000 people working on it. This guy says, I'm the only guy who knows how to do this. I said, what if you quit? He says, the project will fail. He smiles when he says that, right? How fun, what fun is that? So it reduces your truck factor. Everybody, you know, hey, you all will collectively work. What's the speed? Slow. Why is it slow? Because everybody is trying to come up to speed. Six months goes by. Everybody is quietly working because they are familiar. He says, I'm going to go quit. Well, thanks for working with us. And the rest of the team organizes. We bring one other guy. We pull him up. We, but we all have understanding of the code, right? And, and so promote collective ownership. Promote a positive, positive interaction. Give good positive feedback. Tell them, hey, this is how we can improve. And provide constructive feedback. Or, yes, please.
See, but what you're trying to do right now is you're saying, we got to be perfect in what we do. It is, it is competency of the team, right? And if you say, I was working with one guy, he said, I will not write UI code. I told him, there's one thing, you don't know how to write UI code, you and I can pair up and you will learn. But if you will not write UI code, I cannot change you. I can maybe tell the boss to come and you know, slap you around. But it is a willingness. And how did you, you are good at doing something you do today. How did you become good at it? By trying. It's mostly the lack of willingness. I don't want to do it. Versus, you know what? I'm really eager to do this. I'm not good at it today, but I will be. Because I'm smart, I'm professional. I learned this way. If I can learn this, I can learn that. And where is idealism in there? It's pragmatism, in, in fact. Because we want to elevate everybody and not you know, seclude them and say, segregate them. You go only do that. And you know what? Great developers quit when you do that. I work with those guys. They come to the boss and say, you know what? I'm quitting. I can't come and do the same thing because my career is at risk. Because if I want to go look for other job, they ask me, what else can you do? No, this is the only thing I can do. You know how many people I know who lost job and cannot find another job? because that's the only thing they can do and nobody else wants it. It's your career. And we kind of restrict ourselves and then we say this is idealistic. Well, how could it be idealistic when there are so many positive things about it, right? Why do you care about any of these? It is for us to improve. So don't say everybody sits there and write perfect. We already know it's not happening because one guy sits there and writes the code, it's not perfect already. Not that this guy was the master of everything, right? I mean, I've worked in companies where PhDs sit there and write code and say, these guys can rock. And the guy quits and nobody can ever maintain the code anymore. The company is sitting there holding binaries. You could might also say the, the source code is lost. At least it's easier to convince the company that's gone. The source code is here, but nobody can touch it. And we know the evidence is the contrary, right? So we have to kind of say, how could we get out of that rut? That's the whole point. We are assuming that this one person writing code actually is marvelous. The reality is totally not true. I cannot write great code. I've not seen anybody who can write great code. Everybody's code needs to be evolved and reviewed. And the sooner we get to it, the better it is. I've seen companies lose products because of this. Because a guy who would think they are experts end up leaving code that nobody else can maintain. And that is the real bottom line. So, and constant code reviews. And I emphasize this even earlier. But how do you really do constant code reviews? One way is to do, you know, I say, you say, wait, code reviews? Are you crazy about code reviews? You say, the last time we did code review, we were in trouble. You go to the department and say, hey, we got a code review on Thursday, show up at 2 o'clock. And then he says, wait, 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 you guys are going to be going to review my code on Thursday? I'm going to take the day, a sick day that day. I mean, you're going to come and slap me around in the work, I might as well stay home sick. And, and, and she says, I'm already behind my code project. I don't want to waste my time looking at the code he wrote. And the main time the project manager says, wait a minute, code review, is it the guy, is it the time when you all get into a room and you know, post the code on the monitor and review it? Yeah. He says, no, 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 no. Last time we did that, there was a fight. One guy quit, we had to call the cops. No more code review for you, right? It becomes political. We do code reviews all the time, but never go into a room to do it. We do tactical code reviews. I read a piece of code, he reviews it. Next time I write a piece of code, he reviews it. The third time I write a piece of code, she reviews it. I rotate it among these three people. And at the same time, the code he writes, one of us review, and we keep rotating it. And we don't go, you know, we don't give a review to them and follow them home, sit next to them and say, I'm going to make sure you're changing it. Hey, it's a professionalism, right? You wanted my input, I gave it to you. Take it or leave it, and you move on, right? And you tell them that and say, here are the reasons I would change. You decide. But I have reviewed the code and here are my comments about it. And this works really well. Another way to do code review is to pair up. Pair program with somebody. But if you're pairing up with somebody, it already reduces the, the cost, uh, the truck factor a little bit, right? You got another person working with the code. But don't let two people pair up forever. These two people, you know, it's dangerous. These two guys pair up. And they pair up for seven months. And they really get together really well. He says, I quit. You think he's going to quit and be quiet? He's going to go there and say, hey, would you want to come and work? They leave as a pair now. Your truck factor is still a truck factor. I worked in companies like that. One guy quits. Within six months, his entire team is over there. Right? 
because they all like working together. They all leave. Birds of feathers stick together, right? So rotate your pairs. Rotate your pairs so they can cross-pollinate and learn from each other. I'm a huge fan of pairing. I pair on almost everything I do. I do pair presentations from time to time. I like pairing. There are other benefits to pairing. If you're sitting and pairing, what are you doing? You are focused on something. And if you're stuck with something, the other person comes in and helps you out. Andy Hunt has a book on pragmatic thinking and learning. He talks about the left brain versus right brain. He talks about these things. There is another benefit. Often companies say, oh, wait a minute. If I put two programmers alone, they can write code faster. But if two people pair up, they produce only half the amount of code. These people think programmers are stupid typists who can just sit there and type away. That's not programming. I'm not, you're not dictating, I'm not typing. It is, it is design, it's innovation. And when I'm doing it, if, if really typing is fast, what do you need? You don't need programmers. You say, we're looking for programmers, and here's the typing speed we require you to have. Don't ask, do you know Java? Do you know design? How fast can you type? You're hired. Why? Because you can type faster than the other guy. We're not hiring typists, right? So what happens? You are sitting there and programming. I mean, how many, so how is productivity gained? You're helping each other out. You're producing more code. But there's another thing. Honestly, have you been coding? And when you're coding, do you ever get distracted? All the time. The ones who are not raising the hat either are perfect or in denial. What are the chances? We get distracted all the time. You are there sitting and working, and ping, there's an email that pops. We have to respond to the email. Today's worst enemy is Twitter. You got to keep tweeting. What? What, when do you get work done if you're tweeting all day long? So you're sitting there and programming, tweeting, checking your emails and SMS, and then somebody else has to call you, and then we kept distracted. You know, when I work, I don't want to be distracted, meaning I don't want to go do other stuff. I'll turn off email, I'll turn off Twitter, I'll turn off everything that's not essential, and I want to really have a focused time working on the problem. If you come and talk to me, I'll be very angry. But if you and I are pairing up, that's great because we're working on the problem together. Now, you're working on something. There's this term called shaving the yak. What is shaving the yak? The, Google for shaving the yak if you're not familiar with it. Shaving the yak is you do something totally unrelated to what you're working on. You are working your way writing code. You're not sure what function you would call. What's a good way to find what this function is? Real quick. Google for it. What was that? Google for it. So you click on your browser. And the browser says, hey, there's an update available. Would you like to install? Yeah, why not? Click on it. Then you get a proxy error. Huh? What's this proxy error about? I mean, you could have used the older version of browser, but no, you cannot do that, right? I got to check for this proxy error. And then you look for the proxy error. And you're trying to fix that. For that, you had to call this other guy. You called him and he said, yeah, I'll come and help you with proxy error, but can you come and help me with this? You get up and try to help it. And suddenly you find you're sitting in a corner and shaving a yak. They come around and say, dude, what are you doing to this yak over here? I'm shaving it. Why are you shaving a yak in the middle of a day? And how did this yak even come into the office? And you're like, oh, I remember. I wanted this Go API. I went to Google. I better get back to writing that code now. But what happens when you're pairing? You're sitting there and pairing. And hey, what is this API? Google for it. You, you open the browser. Would you like another uh, to, to install a new update? And that guy creates the third. <clears throat> uh, no, not, not, not right now. I have never seen two guys sit together and shave a, shave a yak. <laughs> that never happens. A very, very rare, right? We're in trouble if two guys should to sit together and shave a yak. That is why I love pair programming, right? You got more productivity because of that. So, Code reviews are very useful, but like I said, go try the peer programming and do a tactical code review. Be unemotional about code reviews. Don't get really antsy about it, right? And so when you're doing code review, don't try to criticize people. Instead, give them constructive comments. How do you improve this? That is very important. And don't be very emotional, right? So you want to seek feedback and provide feedback. Be constructive. And so 
do tactical code reviews. So what is a tactical code review? Like I said, go around and have people do smaller, you know, little, little tactical things. Don't try to boil the ocean. And, and let him review the code today, let her review the code tomorrow, and then so on and rotate it. I heard this somebody say, code reviews make me a hero or make me smarter. What a great way to think about it. He said, code reviews make me smarter most of the time because I give it to somebody and they come back and say how to improve it. And very rarely, they come back and say, whoa, I did, not, you could do, I did not know you could do that. And now you're smarter because you showed them something that they didn't know while they were reviewing the code, right? That's very important. So again, rigorous code review and tech, you know, uh, is, is very valuable. Another way to improve code quality, treat warnings as errors. Warnings in code are evil. I worked on a project, and they hired me to get stuff done. So I sat down. I compiled the code. It had 150 warnings. I told myself, Venkat, you are there to write code for them. Don't dig in and start preaching them why they should fix it. All right. And a few minutes later, but I want to see what those warnings are. You're curious, right? So I kind of go in and look at this. And the warning was, if Boolean variable single equals true. This is in production code. Right? Single equals, not two equals. And you're like, okay, you are setting the value. Why are you putting an if around it? The else part never was ever reached. Now I'm curious. I want to see what the next warning could be. It was worse than that. And I found out there were several bugs hidden in the warnings. So I called around and said, guys, come on, let's fix this first. I was in another company. They said, uh, you know, I said, hey, you got to fix all your warnings. Treat warnings as errors. They all laughed at me. I said, you're all laughing. Yeah, that's kind of stupid recommendation. I said, why? Because we got a lot of warnings. I said, oh, really? How many warnings do you have? There was silence in the room. They said, how about just leaving it as a lot? I said, how about 1,000 warnings? They said, eh. How about 10,000 warnings? They said, you don't understand the word lot, do you? And I said, OK. We won't go there. And then I asked them, do you have more warnings today than you did six months ago? They said, of course we do. Said, what do you do about it? They said, what can we do about it? I said, the first thing about solving a problem is to contain it. So I write a little tool, let it go into continuous integration, and measure the warning, number of warnings. OK, now this warning is x. Whatever that x is, the big number we won't talk about, right? And the tool says, if your warning number is x or less, I'll keep quiet. If it is x plus 1, it will fail the build. So what does it mean? You will never be more than x. And you can configure the tool that the minute one programmer takes an act of kindness, and fixes one warning, it's no longer x, but x minus 1, immediately lower that. And in six months, you will have fewer warnings than you did today. So it is not all or nothing. I mentioned this to a company. This was in 2007 time frame. I was back in their office a, a year ago. And then they came to me and said, for the very first time, they got fewer warnings in their system than they ever did. That is pragmatic, in my opinion, right? How you fix it. So treat warnings as errors. And, and I was working on a project. I mentioned this. I said, turn on the flag in the compiler, in the, in the tool, in the IDE. And one of the guys said, eh, no, nope, I don't want to do it. I said, what? Why, why, why don't you want to do it? Isn't that a good idea? He said, no, it's, it's a bad idea. I said, why? He said, I'm going to go walk over to the build machine, and I'm going to set it up on that machine so nobody can check in code with warnings. I went and hugged him. This is great. And that is where you want to catch it. Coverage and complexity. Uh, do you have code coverage? Can you get a feel for how much of code is touched? What's the complexity of the code? What's the code size? What are the duplication? Measure some of these things along the way. And there are tools for these, by the way, right? I'm not going to skip through the tools now. I'm not going to go through the tools. But there's tools for code coverage. You can Google and find these things. You can look at cyclomatic complexity values. There's Thomas McCabe index. But one thing I want to point out is this. You can look at the complexity. You can look at some of these metrics, right? Don't duplicate code. That's another thing you can do. But this is a thing to think about. If I tell you my code has low complexity, that's a good thing, right? But I also have no test or very low test. That's a risk, isn't it? Absolutely. I have low complexity, but very high amount of uh, coverage. This is the world you want to be, right? That's the ideal world you want to be in. Great. What about high complexity and low coverage? 
This is higher than high. This is really messed up beyond repair. But how do you tell the people where you are? So there is actually a very interesting tool for this. It's called change risk analysis prediction, known as the crap metric. The crap metric basically says how crappy the code really is. It looks for a threshold value. If the, code, the value is 30, so what do they do? They measure the test coverage, and they measure the complexity. And then they put together a complex equation to find this. And beyond a certain level, the code has been crossed over to a crappy territory, and you cannot fix it anymore. So that's a tool you could use. There's a tool called Craft4j, for example. So we have to also keep track of quality of code. How do bugs creep in? How do we deal with it? We have to be very careful about it. We got to think about code smells. Code smells come in various forms. How do we deal with code smell? What are some of the code smells we can identify? Long methods, poor variable names, inheritance when we shouldn't use it. There are so many smells we could identify, right? The list goes on and on and on. And we could collectively work together and find these code smells. And, and the, the reason is to not blame it. So basically the idea is that you want to really get quick feedback. And don't try to boil the ocean, right? Give the feedback. So the idea really is that you really want to you know, respond based on the feedback, right? That's the whole idea. So be incremental about it. So you want to deal with code smell. You want to finish up technical debt. Those are extremely important. So essentially, continuously evaluate your technical debt, continuously look at code quality, continuously see how you can improve what you do, right? And again, treat very, very strongly take exceptions. How do you deal with exceptions? Don't, don't, don't you know, close exceptions and quietly tuck it away. Propagate it properly. Those things are important. So to wrap up what we did, I've got to skip a few things here. So essentially, the idea really is this. You really want to continuously evaluate the quality of your code. So a few recommendations to wrap up. The first is continuously practice peer evaluation. Like I said, I cannot think of anything more important than peer evaluations, right? And consider untested code as unfinished code. Testing is so important to do. Make your code coverage and metrics very visible. When others see it, there's a peer pressure to improve it, right? And don't tolerate anyone trashing your code. Take it very serious. Be angry if they...